j, right? So uh, when the system uh, interacts with the environment in general, uh, a pure is, if you start with a pure state or with something which is close to a pure state in a given task of quantum computation or quantum communication or, or, or any task in quantum information, uh, this guy will be transformed to a guy like this due to interaction with the environment. Or any fluctuation uh, will also do this kind of job. So now I will introduce some uh, bits of information theory. And uh, before to talk about quantum information, let us talk about uh, classical information. So Cloud Channel introduced it in 1948, uh, this idea of how to quantify information. And uh, he starts uh, considering the following uh, question. How much information is acquired due to observation of a one given event? And Shane assured that question considering some uh, general properties uh, that a good measurement of information should satisfy. And uh, uh, in, in the end, Shannon concluded that a good measurement of information could be a logarithmic function of the probability uh, 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 of that event happen. And then, if you have a distribution of events, uh, the amount of information, of information that, to, that we will get uh, will be this mean value of this logarithm. So this is known as Shannon entropy. And uh, the name entropy was suggested by Van Neumann to Shannon, and uh, it causes a lot of confusion because it is not the physical entropy. This is uh, an entropy which is related uh, to the amount of information. So we could call this as uh, uh, information quantity instead of, of, of call it as entropy. But everyone call it as channel entropy. Okay, uh, when we have, uh, when, when we tossing a coin, uh, if we have um, uh, 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 an event where we have a binary random variable, like a tossing a coin, uh, we get this kind of binary entropy for the channel entropy. And uh, for a, 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 a perfect coin, where you have 50% of chance to get tails and 50% of chance to, to, to get reds, red, uh, we get uh, the maximum value for this channel entropy. So observing the state of the coin, we will get uh, one bit of information. If the coin is not a fair coin, uh, let us say that we have 100% to get heads, uh, the information that we get observing the coin is zero because there is nothing to observe. Uh, my probability distribution is, is, is just flat. I have just one, one possible value, right? So channel entropy is about the amount of, of information in a given distribution. When we take the logarithm in base two, we are measuring this in bits. So bit is the uh, unit of information. Uh, let us suppose now that we have a message, a text. And uh, let's, let us consider the probability distribution of words in that, in that message. If I have a message where I repeat the same word 1,000 times, we have almost no, inform no information in that message. On the other hand, if I have a message where we use uh, all the words that we know in the dictionary, this message will have a lot of information. Then we will have a probability distribution with a rouge support, and then uh, the channel entropy will be bigger, right? So. These are the ideas of this measurement of information. And now, let us substitute a little bit more. Let us consider that we have a um, probability distribution of uh, two random variables. Let us say x and y. 
then uh, we could look to the joint channel entropy for, for, for this whole distribution. If you take the logarithm in the natural basis, uh, we will get the result, the, the, this, this entropy, uh, uh, this information entropy will be measured in nets or natural units of information. One net is equal to 1.44 bits, right? So depending on the basis of the logarithm, the definition of the unit of information. And uh, when we have this kind of, of, uh, of distribution with two parts, we can also define uh, the entropy of the marginal distribution, the entropy of associated to just one of these two random variables. Let us say the entropy of the x variable is, is equal to this expression here. And then uh, we can uh, draw this kind of diagram, a Venn diagram for these uh, uh, entropies. And uh, this circle represents uh, the, the, the blue circle represents the entropy of the x variable. The red circle represents the entropy of the y variable. And uh, the joint uh, uh, of these two cycles, cycles represent uh, the joint entropy. And this, if this distribution has some correlation between the x and y variable, uh, we will get this uh, region where we have this overlap and this overlap is associated to the mutual information. The mutual information measures how correlated is one random variable to the other random variable. And uh, we can also have um, conditional entropy, uh, which means that if I get some information, if I measure y, this will be the conditional entropy of the variable x given that I have knowledge of y. So just, just the, blue, the blue part with, without this overlap. Uh, just the head part without this overlap is the conditional entropy of variable y, given that I have knowledge of x. And then uh, looking to this Venn Vin dia diagram, we can write several relations between these different entropies. Uh, for example, uh, we can write the conditional entropy in terms of the joint entropy and also the, 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 the marginal entropy. And uh, the mutual information, which measures the correlation between the two distributions, can also be uh, written in three different forms, for example. We can use conditional entropy to, to write in the mutual information, and uh, we can also use the joint entropy to write the mutual information. Okay? Any, any question? Up to this point. Okay. Another question. Is it uh, why? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the 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 idea is to oh, how to quantify information, right? So. Information seems to be an elusive quantity. And then uh, Shannon considered, OK, if I want to quantify information, this quantifier should satisfy some uh, basic properties. And uh, so uh, he write up these four properties. One very important is this additivity. And then uh, he introduced a function of uh, the probability distribution to quantify uh, uh, information in what we call bits. And later on, we realize that that quantity uh, is in fact associated to, for example, the limit for the, the amount of information that we can uh, transmit over a channel. If you have a channel, let us say uh, uh, optical fiber, uh, how much information and how many bits you can transmit in this optical fiber per second. So when you describe your channel, we can find this amount of information that we can uh, propagate in that channel in, in using the channel entropy. The name entropy was suggested by von Neumann. And uh, 
This is true. Did uh, uh, everyone uh, uh, agree that the, the name was suggested by von Neumann? And uh, there are some discussions in the people that study the history of science about what I will talk now. It seems that von Neumann uh, said to Shannon that, okay, this expression is very similar to the physical entropy, to the entropy that we're having in, in statistical mechanics. And then uh, you could call, so von Neumann uh, 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 said it to Shannon, you could call it entropy, and uh, you, you have a kind of uh, competitive advantage because no one knows what entropy meaning <laughs> means, right? But uh, it, um, uh, no one knows if it is really true or if it's a kind of a, a, <laughs> of a joke along the history. But uh, with the interpretation of information theory, now we know what the physical entropy meaning means, right? Because we, we can understand this as how diverse is your distribution of the random variable? For example, when we're tossing a coin, if, our, if my, my coin is a fair coin, I will get the most diverse distribution, and then observing the state of the coin, I will get the maximum information that I can get from a dichotomic variable. So I can get one bit of information looking to the state of the coin after tossing the coin. If the coin is not fair, let us say, uh, if I have 30% uh, probability to get tails and 70% probability to, to, to get heads, I, observing the coin, I will get an, an amount of information which is smaller than one bit because my probability uh, 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 distribution gives some uh, uh, um, uh, uh, gives some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some bias to one of the two possible states, right? So this is more or less the, the meaning. So uh, some people and, and some textbooks also like to use the idea of uncertainty, uh, like to associate the idea of uncertainty to entropy. But uh, it's, it's best to consider diversity instead of uncertainty. So when you have a very diverse probability distribution, we will get a bigger entropy. When we have two random variables, if you have some correlation between the random variables, uh, we have this kind of representation for this uncertainty or for this uh, 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 diversity of the distribution. We will get some overlap. So if you have correlations, when we measure one of the two random variables, we will reduce the uncertainty or the uh, 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 diversity of the other distribution, right? That's why mutual information measured correlation between the distributions. And this gives us an answer in terms of bits. So uh, here I, I, I recommend a few books about this. So there is this very nice book about quantum information theory. It's a, it, it, it's a most one uh, thousand pages just about information theory. This is a nice book about measurement theory in quantum mechanics, and, and, and there are also bits of information here. And this book is really nice about Mies interpretation, Mies with three S interpretations of second law and entropy in thermodynamics. And in this book, there are a lot of discussion about information theory as well. So there is also this another uh, 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 quantifier which is known as, as the relative entropy or the kubak liber divergence. So this quantifier measures how distinguishable is the probability distribution P from the probability distribution Q. But this is not a, a distance measure because if you, you uh, exchange P and Q, we will get another value, right? So this is not a distance. This is not an some authors and some books like to call it as uh, entropic distance, 
but this is not a, a proper distance because it depends on how you uh, uh, name your distributions. So this also gives you an idea about uh, how hard it is to distinguish between these two distributions or uh, how easy we mistake uh, one distribution from another. So there are several protocols in communication theory where uh, this quantity appears to, uh, 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 to, to, to describe exactly uh, how much bits we are losing when we try to describe one distribution using another distribution that will approximate that distribution. And this will appear a lot in quantum information in several situations. And uh, the operational interpretation of that count quantities depending on the protocol. So the same quantity could mean different uh, 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 things in different protocols, right? So now let's go to the quantum information theory. And uh, we will replace the channel entropy by the von Neumann entropy. So instead of half uh, this sum over the logarithm of a distribution, we will have the trace over the density operator and the, the logarithm of the density operator, right? We can write it in base two or in the natural basis. Here I'm using the natural basis because this uh, uh, useful in quantum thermodynamics. And uh, we can also define a relative entropy between two density operators, this uh, Kubak uh, divergence as, as this thing here, and also the mutual information can be written in terms of the divergence if I want. So here I have the state, and here I have a, 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 a separated version of this state, an uncorrelated version of this state. These are the reduced density metrics of the system A, the reduced density metrics of the system B. This is equal to this expression here. So the same expression that we had for the mutual information before, but now with uh, the von Neumann entropy. And uh, when we try to translate the relations uh, from the classical information theory to the quantum information theory, it's a slippery business uh, we have to take care because uh, we have um, uh, uh, some some differences in 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 in, in uh, what we can call. So we can think that the density operator is a kind of a generalized uh, distribution, quasi probability distribution. This is an operator. This is not a a, a distribution itself. So, uh, for example, we have this expression for the conditional entropy in the classical information theory. Here we have the joint entropy, and here we have uh, the marginal entropy. There are some states in quantum mechanics where the joint entropy is, is mo smaller than the marginal entropy, this the von Neumann entropy. This never happens in a classical scenario, but this could happen in a quantum scenario, and I will give you an example of that. Uh, let us suppose that uh, we have a, density, a pure density operator where, sorry, where uh, the state is a maximally entangled state. So, like this. So, the von Neumann entropy of the joint state will be zero because it's a pure state. On the other hand, the marginal state, which is the trace over the variable B of the joint state, will be equal to identity divided by two. So this is the maximum entropy state. And then if we use this expression, we will get a negative entropy. And as some people try to, to give some meaning 
to this negative entropy in quantum mechanics, and there is also this very nice paper published in 2011. But uh, maybe we should not call this quantity as uh, conditional entropy, because uh, any information quantifier should be positive, right? But but okay, that quantity has some uh, some uh, some interpretation. Sorry. Uh, not necessarily. Actually, they made a kind of connection with the Maxwell Demon. But uh, uh, the point is, when we measure a system in a classical scenario, uh, our observation of the system does not affect the distribution, right? When we measure a system in a quantum scenario, the observation of the system will modify the, the, the entropy of the system. For example, uh, so uh, this conditional entropy involves a measurement in one of the random variables. So which maybe we should consider this. I, I've shown a generalization of this uh, uh, idea of conditional entropy, the next slide. And uh, so in the quantum scenario, there is, a, in the classical scenario, uh, there are several expressions to, uh, uh, to the mutual information. So we can write the mutual information in terms of the joint, the joint entropy and the marginal entropy, or we can write the mutual information in terms of the conditional entropy. In the quantum scenario, these two expressions are not equivalent anymore. And uh, one possible candidate for the conditional entropy in the quantum scenario was introduced by Oliver and Zurich in 2001 as this expression here. So uh, the entropy reduction that we will get in the system A after the observation of the system B could be written as the mean value of the entropy, of the marginal entropy of the system A, given that we observed uh, the joint system uh, we observe the part B of the joint system, right? So this is uh, the conditional state after the observation of the part B of the system uh, with the outcome J. I'm considering projective measurements. We can also consider another kind of measurements in this definition, if, if you want. So, and this is the probability to get a given outcome in the measurement of the system B, right? So this is the conditional density operator after the observation of the system B and get the outcome J, okay? And then uh, when we define uh, the conditional entropy in this way, we can write the, the mutual information in terms of the conditional entropy as uh, this expression. And here we have the usual mutual information. And then we can, as the observation will depends on the choice of the basis, we can also optimize, we can maximize the basis choice, and then we have this quantity here, which is the expression for the mutual information uh, 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 based in this joint entropy, and the expression for the mutual information based in this conditional entropy, and, and uh, here we maximize over all possible measurement bases, and this is known as quantum discord. So the idea is, uh, if the mutual information measures the total correlation between the two systems, in the mutual information, we will have one part which is classical and one part which is quantum. And the quantum discord uh, will be the quantum part of this kind of, uh, of correlation. For pure state, quantum, this quantum discord is equivalent to entanglement, is equal to an entanglement measurement. For mixed state, the entanglement measurement and, and this quantum discord are different. Uh, for example, uh, for a state uh, like this one, this is the Werner state, so uh, this projector is a maximally entangled state of two qubits, like uh, the bell basis state, like a state, uh, a state like this one. And here, eta uh, measures how pure is the state. So I'm mixing a uh, pure state with the identity with white noise, right? When eta is equal to one, uh, one 
measure of entanglement. When quantif yeah, it's not a quantifier, but this detecting entanglement, the, ne the logarithmic negativity. So, um, and then, uh, are, are you all familiar with the definition of an entangled state? So we define entangled state as a state that cannot be constructed by local operations in classical communication, right? So a separable state, a separable state is a state that could, could be written like this. Here I have J over J. I have a convex combination of density operators of part A and part B, right? This is a separable state, but this is not necessarily a classical state. So definition of what is classical and what is quantum is not an, an easy task and it's also slippery. Uh, for example, for this state here, uh, depending on the value of eta, in this axis we have eta, uh, this state can violate the Bell inequality. But uh, we can have a, a mixed state that does not violate the Bell inequality, but it is still entangled in the sense that it cannot be written in this way. It cannot be constructed by LOCC, local operations in classical communication. At some point, the, the state become disentangled. It's not an entangled state anymore, but the nature of correlations are not necessarily classical if you consider this kind of discord between classical and quantum information, right? In fact, uh, if you write this other uh, family of states, this is known as Bell diagonal states. So uh, this is not the most general two qubit state. This is just uh, one, one class of two qubit state. But this is nice because we can write a kind of a parameter space in terms of the C's. Here we have Pauli matrix. And uh, we can also write this state uh, in, in, in this way, right? So we have the uh, maximally entangled state, the Bell basis states in the vertices of this tetahedron. In the blue region is the region where this state violates the Bell inequality. So here we have C1, C2, C3, it, it, it are the components of, of, of the polymatrix. In the yellow region, this uh, yellow tetrahedron tetra outside of this green octahedron are entangled states. Inside of this green octahedron are separable states, and the only states that, that has zero quantum discords are the states over the axis. This point here uh, means the identity. So uh, we have very few, according to this uh, classification, we have very, very few classical states when we look to, uh, to in, in, in uh, concerning its correlations when we look to a mixed state. So there are, some, there are some protocols where the quantum discord is the resource that we use to get advantage in quantum uh, tasks. And, uh, and, and, and there are also protocols where entanglement is the resource that we use to get advantage in communication, in cryptography, et cetera. And there is also, uh, I'm not talk much about this, but, but there are a lot of, of, of work in this quantum discord and, and also other, other, other kind of discords between uh, non, uh, actually non-equivalence between classical and quantum information uh, description. And uh, there is also this quantity here which is useful. I will, I will use this in, in, in the next slides, which is the information gain. This is the amount of information that we gain when we perform a quantum measurement. So this is the von Neumann entropy of the state, and this is the von Neumann entropy of the state after the measurement. So I'm considering a non-selective projective measurement. When we perform a non-selective projective measurement, uh, your output state oh, so. Yeah. I, Actually, here, P of, of, of L is the probability to get a given outcome in the measurement process. And this is the output state uh, associated to this outcome. So this is the 
the projection of the density operator in the basis that the, in the state of the basis that we are measuring measuring if you consider projective orthogonal projective measurements but you can also consider POVM measurements so okay so yeah so this is the information gain is it... okay now I will talk a little bit about quantum metrology as I promised to you. So, uh, in general, in, 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 in any metrology protocol, uh, we have this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, picture. Uh, we, we start with our measurement apparatus, in general, at thermal equilibrium with the environment. And then we prepare a probe system. We could prepare a pure system. We can prepare an entangled system and then, after preparing this probe system, the system will interact with something, and uh, we, will in, we will encode in that system, let's say, a phase, a relative phase, uh, phi, uh, which is associated to the, uh, 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 to the quantity that we want to measure. And then, uh, we have to choose a nice, uh, 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 measurement protocol in order to get information about phi with some uh, uh, uncertainty. When we perform this measurement uh, scheme in a classical scenario, uh, the error for the variance of uh, here I have bar phi, here I have phi, but they are the same, right? The variance of this uh, 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 variable that I, I want to measure is limited by a quantity, from the theoretic, theoretical point of view, it's limited by a quantity that we call Fisher information. We can compute the Fisher information, the maximum of the Fisher information in, in, in some strategy. And uh, in the classical scenario, this grows as one over square root of n, one, where n is the number of times that we perform the measurement protocol, right? We learn it in the, in the basic physics lab. When we do it using a quantum system, we can use uh, correlated systems, entangled, uh, entangled probes, for example, we can get this scaling one over n, where n is not necessarily the number of times that we try to measure the, the system, but it could be the number of uh, parts of the entangled states, the number of uh, qubits in the entangled state because we can also perform measurements in the classical way in a parallel way, right? But the scaling is at most one over uh, square root of n. So we have a kind of quadratic advantage in the quantum scenario. Uh, this quadratic advantage means that if I want to measure uh, uh, with a given precision in the classical setup, uh, if I have to perform 10,000 measurements to to get uh, some precision in the classical setup. In the quantum setup, I, ju I just want to perform 100 of measurements. So it's quadratic, but it's still good. And uh, this quant the quantum feature information uh, is given by uh, an expression uh, like this one. And uh, these uh, probabilities to get the value of phi uh, should be optimized uh, to the best by the best possible p over m measurements. So it's not the, an easy task to compute uh, this feature information in a general scenario where we have noise and uh, the coherence or things like that. For pure state and unitary evolutions, we have a closed formula. It does not so uh, having. A, a, a good fish information does not mean that your metrolog met metrological protocol will get uh, this bound because you, you have to choose correctly your strategy, your probe, uh, how the probe interacts with the system that you, you want to measure, right? Worries? F. Ah, in the last, F is the feature information. Is that quantity here. So this is what we call uh, the kramer hall bound. So this is the bound for the uncertainty of your measurements. So, 
sorry, I'm putting a lot of information in a, in a small space. <laughs> and uh, these are the fish information, uh, how, how we compute the fish information. So we have a kind, in the end of the day, we have a kind of a, an eigenvalue problem. So these two papers discuss uh, very nicely how to compute the fish information. And uh, in the noise scenario, uh, it's not easy to, show, to solve. So uh, to exemplify some uh, advantages that we can get in quantum information uh, in metrology, I, will, I, I choose this example because uh, we work in this example. And uh, uh, this was published in that paper. Let us consider the, the following situation. Uh, you, have, you, you have a probe. Your probe is composed by two parts, part A and part B. And then uh, we will, the probe will interact with the system that we want to measure. We will get some information about phi, and then you measure the probe. Uh, so if you have global access to the whole probability distribution, P, A, and B, uh, of the measurements that you will perform, uh, you have this global strategy. But let us consider that we don't have a detector which is able to uh, measure the global probability distribution. We only measure uh, the local parts of the distribution. We can only measure the marginal distribution of B and the distribution of A given that we have information about B, right? You can do it in an adaptive way. We can, we, you can choose uh, which kind of measure you will perform in, in, in the A variable, considering the previous uh, result that you have. So you will have uh, information about uh, these two distributions. Uh, we can prove that the fission information, don't, don't, don't worry about the maths, right? But anyway, we can prove that the fish information is uh, uh, ad ad adaptatively additive. So the global strategy is equal to the local strategy for classical probability distribution because we have the bias role. So we use the bias role to, to, to show this. The joint probability distribution is equal to the distribution of B uh, times the distribution of A given B. When we go to a quantum scenario, as the measurement will disturb the system, this is not adaptive anymore. So uh, this is uh, the, the, the algorithm. This is a synot gate. This is a Hadamard gate. This is a unitary evolution where the system will get uh, some uh, phase phi. Right? And this is, again, synot gate, Hadamard gate. When we do this synot gate in Hadamard gate, we can perform a measurement in the bell basis, as I commented yesterday. Uh, but let us suppose I'm not able to perform a synot gate at the end, in the readout uh, of the protocol. I can only measure locally uh, the state of qubit B, and then I can choose a rotation, I can choose a basis to measure the state of the, uh, of the uh, qubit A. In this scenario, uh, the amount of, uh, of, of, of information that we get here to estimate the value of phi, so the, the adaptive feature information in the quantum scenario, could be smaller than the information that we get here. For pure states, these two protocols are equal. There is no difference. But when we have a quantum uh, uh, mixed state, we have a difference between these two protocols. So this is a, one difference from the classical metrology protocol. And uh, when we do it, uh, this phase estimation protocol with any qubits, uh, the difference between the two protocols scales in this way. So the adaptative protocol is proportional. I'm considering now a Werner state. So uh, it's difficult to, to, to make these calculations for a general state. For a Werner state, uh, we can show that, uh, or, or, or at least we can argue that 
we have the optimal protocol for uh, the ad adaptive case and for the coherent case. So th this is also about the role of this coherent operation in the readouts. So we have a state like this, the Werner state, where eta is now the amount of noise, the amount of white noise that I have in the state. So when we do it with this, uh, the, the calculations with this uh, uh, Werner state, uh, we get that the performance of the adaptative protocol, this is the efficient information for the adaptative protocol, uh, uh, for a large number of qubits, will be approximately uh, this. So this is the amount of noise that we have. As, uh, as bigger is your noise, as bigger will be the gap between the adaptative protocol and the coherent protocol. So besides correlations, uh, coherent operations also plays a very important role in quantum protocols, in quantum information. So this is an experiment that was not published, but uh, uh, look just to, the, to these uh, theoretical lines. So this is this uh, phase estimation protocol implemented for a two qubit system. Uh, the limit for the classical measurement of a phase here uh, it will be the short noise limit. It's about one over square, square root of two. The Heisenberg limit, which is the quantum limit, the limit using an entangled state, uh, is equal to one half. This is the quadratic uh, 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 overperformance that we get when you use a quantum system. And here we use that uh, Werner state. This is the amount of noise. So for a pure state, if eta is equal to zero, the two protocols will coincide. The adaptative one, the, head, the red curve and dots are the adaptative strategy. The blue curve and dots are the coherent strategy. This experiment was performed using NMR, and I, I will talk about NMR in, in the next slides. So here we can see that the gap between the coherent strategy and the adaptative strategy increases as we increase the noise. Even in the regions where we don't have entanglement anymore, we still have this kind of gap. So this is a kind of a discord in quantum in metrology. Uh, in the classical scenario, we, we don't have this kind of gap. So we have a kind of coherent arrangement in this metrology protocol. So this is just to, to, to give you a taste about uh, uh, what is quantum metrology. And uh, any, any, any question about quantum metrology? Uh, it measures the amount of um, information uh, uh, when, 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 when we try to estimate the value of phi, and uh, we will estimate this value with some error because uh, we don't have an uh, infinite number of repetitions of measurements, right? So. You have a, a distribution, what is not your true distribution, which is an approximation of your distribution with, uh, of your measurements, be, uh, uh, because you just perform uh, a, a finite number of measurements, so you have some uncertainty in your distribution. So this uncertainty will, uh, 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 will be translated as an uncertainty in the variable that we, we are trying to estimate. So this is the uh, square root error of your measurement, the delta phi. And the deficient information gives you the bound for this error in your measurement process. So the deficient information gives you information about how precisely you will be able to describe your variable with a given probability distribution in the measurement protocol. Yeah, how good will be your estimation protocol, right? Because you repeat the, the measurement several times in order to get a, a mean value, right? So, uh, 
So and uh, and and uh, you have an expression for that. It comes from information theory. And uh, we also have the quantum version for that. And uh, what is surprising is in the quantum version, when we use this generated an entangled state, if we start with zero here and zero here, this will generate a maximum entangled state. If I have noise, the entanglement could not be maximum or, or, or the state could not be entangled as well. But when we have an entangled state, we can do better than what we can do in the classical scenario. And uh, for pure state, this uh, uh, a coherent operation here, so a synot gate is a coherent operation. We, we need to let the two quantum systems interact in a controlled way. Uh, it's not necessary for a pure state. This scheme is equal to this scheme. For mixed states, this scheme could not be equal to this scheme. But we only tested it for white noise. If you have another kind of noise, uh, you got different results. But we don't know how to do the calculations, the theoretical calculations. <laughs> Maybe we have to do the experiment before. Okay, but it, it, it's also difficult to show that uh, you have the optimal protocol in your metrology setup, you know? It's not, uh, 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 there, is, there is no way to, uh, the only way to, to guarantee that your protocol is optimal is compare the result of your protocol with the feature information. If you achieve the kramer how bound, so your protocol is optimal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can perform the two protocol with the same amount of noise, and we can also perform a classical protocol with the same kind of noise, and then we can compare all of them, and then we can see, okay, uh, it, because this is another thing. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in general, with, okay, the best classical protocol is the short noise, and then if you are below the short noise, we get some advantage. But even in the noise scenario, if you compare our quantum noise protocol with a classical protocol with the same noise, we maybe get some, some advantage. So even, even above the short noise, if, because here we are comparing a quantum protocol with, which has a lot of noise with a classical protocol without noise. But sometimes, uh, you can also get advantage even in a very noisy scenario. Now there are a lot of people looking for this, these situations. So, but we, we have to do the fair comparison. We have to consider also the classical protocol with noise. Otherwise, we are comparing something with that is, for example, this is the optimal classical protocol, the, the short noise. But if your classical protocol is not optimal, you will not reach the short noise limit, right? So yeah, this is the idea of this area. And there are a lot of applications in quantum metrology. Also, LIGO works with quantum metrology. And th there is also another way to do quantum metrology using nonlinear operations. For example, at LIGO, they use uh, squeezed states. And then they, the, uh, uh, the quantum enhancement of a squeezed state is much bigger than this quadratic uh, enrangement. So now I will talk about some experiments uh, uh, that, that, that we did, and uh, you, you will see the quantum information play a role in this quantum thermodynamics, and uh, you, uh, I, I hope to convince you that we can transform information in energy, or we can, we can use information to get some uh, other advantages. So uh, this is a very nice setup to test some properties in, in, of quantum protocols, but this is a not nice setup to build a quantum computer because it is not scalable. Uh, the major part of the tests in quantum computing, uh, test of algorithm in quantum computing was first performed in this kind of setup because here we have a very fine control of the system. So uh, this, uh, uh, an, 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 a nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectrometer. Here, inside of this vessel, we have uh, um, 
uh, a vacuum chamber, then we have nitrogen, then we have another vacuum chamber, then we have liquid helium. Inside of this liquid helium chamber, we have a superconducting coil, a very big superconducting coil. Uh, with a, in our case, with a current about 117 uh, 70 uh, amperes. And this will produce a magnetic field about 11.75 teslas. This magnetic field opens a gap in the nuclear spin of the hydrogen, which is about uh, 500 megahertz. So we say that this is a 500 megahertz spectrometer. When we consider other nuclear spins, we will get other uh, uh, different uh, resonance frequencies. For example, for the carbon-13, we have 126 megahertz of resonance frequency. For the deuterium, 77 megahertz. Uh, for fluor, uh, 470 mega, megahertz, and so on. Also, when we consider a molecule, so the idea is to, to, to if you, we want to start a given molecule, we will put that molecule inside of a glass tube, a very thin glass tube, five millimeter tube, in order to get a very uh, uh, homogeneous field in the center of, of, of the magnet. Uh, we will put just 1% one, 1 of this uh, uh, molecule that we want to start in a solvent, in a delta red solvent. So in the solvent, we don't have hydrogen. We only have deuterium. Then we can observe the hydrogen, which is uh, only due to the sample that we want to analyze. And uh, this is one example of, of, of such a sample. This is the chloroform. Here we can encode one quantum bit in the hydrogen nuclei and also another quantum bit in the carbon nuclei. And we also have uh, chlorine here that will play just a role of an environment. The relaxation time of the chlorine is very fast. Then I can manipulate the uh, magnetic states of this nuclei using radio frequency fields. And uh, as the sample is very diluted, I can neglect any interaction between different molecules. So I have an ensemble of molecules, in our case, 10 to 17 molecules, but uh, the molecules does not interact with each other. Of course, the molecule interacts with, with the solvent. And depending on the chemical bound, we also can have different frequencies for some uh, nuclei, uh, which is linked uh, to different parts of the molecule. And uh, depending on the isotope, we have different frequencies. For example, uh, the carbon-12, which, which is the most common carbon, has uh, is the nuclear spin equal to zero. So I, I don't have any signal from the carbon-12. I only have signal from the carbon-13. So in this area, we have to buy sometimes very expensive samples because we need a very pure sample with some isotope. And uh, so now uh, I will try to convince you that I have a quantum computer inside of a glass tube in a liquid state. So when we perform measurements and operations over that system, we are performing a kind of a spatial measurement. So when I get a signal, I get a signal which is a mean signal from a, a, a sample of uh, several molecules. Uh, this, this is the effective Hamiltonian for that molecule, for the chloroform molecule. And uh, we have, we can uh, pulse the system uh, in resonance or off of resonance uh, with, with, with the natural frequency of the hydrogen or the carbon. And we also have this interaction term, which is a kind of a scalar coupling, like an Ising Hamiltonian uh, between the hydrogen and the carbon. This is effective. This is mediated by the chemical bound. This is not a direct interaction between the two dipoles. And uh, we can also switch on and switch off magnetic fields. So we can add these terms in the Hamiltonian. And these are the typical spectrum that we have. And the frequency of this interaction between the two qubits is about, uh, sorry, it's not megahertz. It's just hertz. Ah, here, here, here in the interaction frequency. Sorry, uh, one, uh, 125 hertz. And these are the frequency of the free 
uh, part of the Hamiltonian. We can also go to the interaction picture, just setting the observable in the electronics. Then in that system, uh, we, if we prepare an initial uh, uh, magnetization in our system, uh, the, the coincidence time for, for, for this kind of molecule uh, are these ones. So I have two kinds of decoherence in, 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 in this uh, uh, setup. One, one decoherence is, is associated to this spin lattice relaxation, with, which is an amplitude damping. Here we are reducing the energy of the system. We are exchanging energy with the environment, and it is about a few seconds. And uh, we also have this transverse relaxation, which is a dephasing. And uh, in this, def this dephasing time is, it is a little bit smaller, but it is still about a second. The time interval that takes to perform a pi over two rotation, for example, if I want to rotate a qubit uh, from uh, the sigma, the, uh, one, one sigma z eigen state to a sigma x eigen state, for example, a pi over two rotation takes uh, seven or eight microseconds, 10 to minus six seconds. So I can perform a lot of unitary operations uh, before the system lose coherence. And uh, I can prepare initial states using, so in this diagram, I represent here uh, rotations. Actually, this is a modulated heat frequency pulse that you will implement a rotation in one of the nuclei. Uh, in the uh, y direction, I, I represent it as, as blue. In the x direction, I represent it as uh, red. I can choose the direction. Uh, actually, in that system, the z direction is defined by the direction of this strong magnetic field. Then the spin system will process along this strong magnetic field. And uh, I can choose some phase of, the uh, of, of this precession movement to be my x direction. The x and the y direction can be chosen by an electronic way, right? And after that, I can, after fixing these directions, I can perform rotations. And uh, here, uh, this uh, orange connection means that a free evolution under this Ising Hamiltonian, sigma z, sigma z interaction. Uh, this shadow area is uh, a field gradient. We can apply a field gradient in the system in order to induce the phasing, to induce full the phasing. So I can erase the off-diagonal elements of the density matrix. So we start from a thermal state. Actually, this is the maximum temperature thermal state for the system. And then performing such an evolution, I can prepare a given state. Let like I say, I can prepare uh, the buff spin system in the ground state, or I can prepare a thermal state in the hydrogen and uh, a, a ground state in the carbon, for example. Are you just yes. yes. Why? Why? Okay. So the idea is. I, I have this tube here, and then I have a gradient in that direction. Here I have one spin which is processing uh, with some velocity, right? Then here I have another that will press processing with another velocity, and so on. So when we switch on the gradient, the velocity of processing of this guy will be different from the velocity of processing of this guy, and also of this guy, and so on. So in the end of the day, I will have uh, each spin in a different point. When we take the mean value over all the sample, we get the phasing. So, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this is the state preparation. There is a trick thing here which is actually we prepare in that system what we call pseudo-pure states. We, we, we will not prepare a pure state. So this is a kind of uh, idealization. Uh, in fact, 
uh, what what we prepare here is a state with its identity over four plus uh, what we call deviation matrix. This epsilon is about 10 to minus five. So I have just 10 to minus five, 10 to minus six. So I have one part in a million of the system in the magnetization that I want. But uh, the other part of the system is in the identity operator. And uh, every observable that I measure has uh, trace zero. I will measure sigma x and sigma y, the transverse magnetization. So I will not get any information about this is a kind of expansion of the density operator. I will not get any information about this identity. One minus epsilon here. So in the end of the day, uh, where you have the dynamics of a pure state in that system. Okay, this is uh, how we measure the system. So uh, uh, this is valid for a two qubit uh, a molecule like the chloroform. Uh, when, when we let the system relax again to the thermal equilibrium, uh, we will get a signal, we will measure uh, uh, the radio frequency field, the radio frequency field emitted by the system. It's important to say that I have one part in, in, in a million of the system in the magnetization that I want, but I have 10 to 17 molecules. So I have 10 to 12 molecules in the magnetization that I want. That's why the signal to noise ratio is quite high in that system. So this is the free induced decay. So the, this is the, the signal that we measure when we let the system relax. Uh, we can also apply some pulses before to let the system relax, and then we can measure the magnetization of the hydrogen, of the carbon, or we can measure any, any correlation function that I want. I can measure any uh, sigma j of hydrogen times sigma j of carbon. So it's possible to measure any correlation function, also with more spins. And uh, analyzing this signal, taking the, the, the Fourier transform of that signal, uh, we get a spectrum. This is the spectrum, uh, this, this is the carbon spectrum, uh, and uh, zero is the resonance frequency, that's why I have a negative frequency here. So these are relative frequencies, right? People in NMR like this kind of, 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 of pictures. So this is the spectrum of a thermal state, and uh, each line of the spectrum is associated to a transition here in my two qubit system. So looking to the spectrum, I can know uh, what was the magnetization of the system before the relaxation, what was the population of each level, and uh, I can also have information about the coherence, uh, uh, the, about the, 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 the coherences of each state. I can also play with more qubits. For example, uh, using that molecule where we have three, three fluoride, this is, uh, then, this is a, 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 a three fluor iod, iodine at N. And uh, here I have three fluorine, a normal carbon, carbon 12, and one iodine here. And uh, uh, due to this asymmetry in this molecule, we have different, different resonance frequencies for these three fluorines, but the distance in frequency of the three fluorine is just kilohertz in that case. In the other case, I have megahertz. And uh, here, uh, in order to manipulate just one of these fluorine, I have to modulate pulses in order to uh, selective uh, interact with just one of these fluorines. But I can use this as a three qubit system and uh, the, the, the spectrum become a little bit more, more complicated. So the record for that system to uh, manipulate quantum information is 12 qubits. And uh, I can perform a Hadamard gate just combining these rotations, these y and x rotations in this way, for example. I can perform a C0 gate combining these free evolution with rotations so I can perform any computation in that system. And uh, I can prepare states with very high fidelity. These, these are the varying states. So, so uh, 
uh, this is uh, the theoretical prediction, the, 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 the experimental result. Uh, this is a quantum state tomography of the state. So uh, this is the representation of a density operator in terms of these bars. So uh, uh, the size of the bar is uh, the, 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 uh, the component of, of, of the density matrix in that basis, in the computational basis. So uh, this is uh, equivalent to a maximally entangled state, to a Bell-based state, and this is the equivalent of the Werner state with 50% uh, 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 noise of white noise. And, and this is the sequence that we use to prepare a state like this. So now I start to talk about quantum thermodynamics. I know that uh, some of you are interested in this topic, and uh, uh, this is a very nice article. This is a news article. It's not a, a, a review article, but it's nice to read uh, about this quantum thermodynamics revolution. So as we have this uh, quantum technology revolution, uh, it's natural to also have a quantum thermodynamics revolution. So uh, let me... Uh, um, back a little bit to this uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics. So when we perform work in a non-equilibrium way, in a finite time way uh, uh, over a system, uh, part of the work that we are performing on a system will be uh, an irreversible work. Actually, it will be dissipated, right? For example, uh, when when we perform work over a system in a very slow way, in a quasi-static way, all the work that we perform will be stored in the system as a variation of the free energy. Uh, if we do it faster, we will get one part of this work that will be wasted, right? That we, we will lose due to an increase in entropy. The variation of entropy will be also associated to this entropy production due to perform the protocol in a finite time way. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy production is always positive and the minimum value is equal to zero when we do it in a reversible way. And uh, also the irreversible work is also bigger than zero. We can also write uh, the entropy production in a protocol where we don't have uh, uh, ex uh, energy exchange with a reservoir, where we only have work when, when we drive a system, for example. In this way, uh, this is beta, uh, the work performance minus the variation of the free energy. So this is the amount of entropy that we produce. Uh, we can show that the efficiency of a thermal engine, for example, uh, can be written in terms of uh, the, 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 the uh, usual cardinal efficiency minus the entropy production that your protocol is, is introducing. So the entropy production is what prevents you to reach the best limit for a given protocol in thermodynamics, right? So we can also understand free energy as uh, a viability of your work, if you have uh, the, that that we can extract from a system, so uh, if you have access to a single temperature reservoir, we can understand that the free energy is the amount of energy that could be extractable from the system, right? And then uh, we can also have a, a, a representation of the second law of thermodynamics in terms of uh, the mean value of work and the free energy uh, in this way. So the work that you, you are, you are uh, 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 doing on a system is always bigger than the variation of the free energy. So the work that you, you are doing on a system is bigger than the amount of energy that we can encode in the system to be extractable in a second path, for example in a second step of a protocol. So let's go how to define these quantities in quantum mechanics. And uh, there is this very nice paper uh, uh, by some colleagues uh, showing that work is not unobservable. So uh, 
in quantum mechanics. So uh, work is a, is, a, it, 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 it is a quantity that depends on the protocol. For example, if I have a Hamiltonian and then I vary the Hamiltonian in time, I have a, a process that, that vary the Hamiltonian in time, uh, the work that we are performing on the system or the work that we are extracting on the system depending on how we do this variation. So uh, the idea is to consider uh, a scenario like this. We have initially uh, uh, an equilibrium state, so I can write the Gibbs state, uh, the density operator for the Gibbs state in this way. Here we have the exponential of beta Hamiltonian over the partition function. We can also write this state as in the energy basis. So if you have a discrete spectrum for the Hamiltonian in a given time, let us suppose that this depends on time, and uh, these are the eigenstates, and here I have an instantaneous value of energy for the state J. And then uh, we can write the Gibbs state in this way. I have a sum over J beta the energy in a, in a given time, the projector of the state in this given time Oh, sorry. Let 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 me put the initial state right, because because only the, the initial state is in the equilibrium. Divided by the partition function, and the partition function is the trace of this guy here. Right? So uh, let us suppose that I, I, I have an equilibrium state, and then I change the Hamiltonian uh, according to a protocol. And this lambda is the variable that uh, defines the protocol that I'm changing the Hamiltonian. I will end up, this is a unitary evolution, but I will end up in a state which is not an equilibrium state anymore. If I change the Hamiltonian, uh, very fast, I will get transitions between the eigen uh, states of the system, and uh, if I change the Hamiltonian very slow in an adiabatic way, it's still a non-equilibrium state because uh, the weight of the state will not be the Gibbs weights anymore if the final Hamiltonian is different from the initial Hamiltonian. And then, after this, we let the system thermalize with the environment. So, uh, to describe the thermodynamics of a, a, a non-equilibrium system, there is these very nice fluctuation theorems, and uh, when we want to describe a small system, like a, a system that we use in, in quantum technology, uh, we will get systems that uh, uh, are far from the thermodynamic equilibrium, for, sorry, for the thermodynamic uh, uh, limit, and then we will get a lot of fluctuations, right? and energy fluctuations. So uh, this is how we define work for a quantum system. So the idea is uh, we only have this protocol where we are changing the Hamiltonian, and uh, the change of the Hamiltonian is fast enough to uh, don't get any energy exchange with the environment, right? So the idea is to have this protocol fast enough uh, to uh, uh, to, uh, uh, it's not necessary to consider the coherence along the protocol because there is, it, it's much faster than the time, uh, than the decoherence time. So there is no uh, 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 interaction with the environment during the protocol. After the protocol, the system will interact with the environment. And uh, so we can, in this way, we can consider the first law of, term, of thermodynamics. We can uh, equal work as the variation of the internal energy of the system. Uh, when we do it, we can write, uh, uh, so this is the initial equilibrium state, this is the final state that, that was produced by the protocol, by the time-dependent protocol. 
So I have a, a unitary evolution, which is the solution of that equation. If the uh, Hamiltonian does not commute in different times, uh, the calculation of the unitary evolution is difficult, as we know, right? And uh, we can write this mean value in terms of uh, a probability distribution. So we can write it in terms of an energy difference between the initial spectrum and the final spectrum. The probability of occupation of the initial state with are the Gibbs uh, weight and a transition probability between the initial state and the final state. So the transition probability element is computed like this. This is the unitary evolution. So uh, if I start in the ground state, I have some probability to end up in one of the excited states if I proceed the protocol very fast. If I proceed the protocol in the limits of the quantum adiabatic theorem, I will not have transition, transition to excited states. The, the, the ground state stay in the ground state, but the, spec, the energy spectrum is different at the end. So, and then uh, we can write uh, this work now in quantum mechanics is a kind of stochastic variable. So I have to consider all the possible transitions here. So I have a probability distribution for work and I can write a continuous uh, 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 version of this distribution and then here I will introduce this Dirac delta. This is just another way to, to, to describe this distribution here. And people usually call this transition probability uh, due to the protocol of changing the Hamiltonian as quantum fluctuations. And these are what we call thermal fluctuations. The, 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 the weights in the initial state due to the uh, Gibbs distribution, right? So, then, if I want to do something useful, I have to, to find a way to measure this distribution of work. And there are some uh, very nice theorems which uh, 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 are satisfied for a, a far from equilibrium system, and also it's also valid just for one Brownian particle, for example, in the classical scenario. It's also valid for one qubit in the quantum scenario. So uh, this, in these fluctuation theorems, we can recover equalities even in a far from equilibrium situation. So when we have this kind of protocol where we start from an equilibrium state, then we change the Hamiltonian and, uh, and, and we bring the system to a non-equilibrium state. If you consider the backward version of the protocol, I can get the, 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 the time inversion version of the, of the protocol, we can change the Hamiltonian in the backward way, starting from the equilibrium state of the final Hamiltonian, and we will end up in a non-equilibrium state. And if you have the distribution of work for the forward protocol divided by the backward protocol, we can prove that this is equal to this exponential of beta. Beta is one over KBT, is the inverse, inverse temperature, uh, here we have the work minus the variation of free energy. So this is known as the Crookes theorem, and this is valid for a classical or a quantum system, for a stochastic classical system or a quantum one. And we also have the Jarzinski identity, which is in fact a corollary of this uh, theorem. And here we have the mean value of the exponential of work. This is a very non-equilibrium quantity that, that, that depends on the process. And here we have some equilibrium quantity, which is the variation of free energy. So this gives us a kind of law about how the fluctuations will behave in that system. And this also encodes uh, the second law of thermodynamics. So from this equality, we can show that we can obtain the second law of thermodynamics using the Jensen's inequality, which is valid for a, a convex function like, like, like the exponential, right? So, uh, and the second law says to, says to us that the future availability is never bigger than the present cost. So, uh, the fact that the work minus the variation of free energy be always bigger than zero uh, says that there is no free latch, right? And, uh, 
these fluctuation theorems also enable us to compute a lot of uh, limits in non-equilibrium uh, stochastic thermodynamics. And people will start to describe uh, the non-equilibrium thermodynamics of a quantum system using uh, these ideas that they borrow from uh, the stochastic thermodynamics of, uh, of, of a small system, the stochastic classical thermodynamics of small systems. Uh, the first step is to uh, be able to measure the statistics of work or statistics of heat. Since uh, I can also introduce a definition for heat similar to the definition of work that I introduced before. And the first step uh, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, thing could be the description of this probability distribution in an experimental setup. How to measure the probability distribution in an experimental setup. So again, uh, I have this protocol where I'm changing the Hamiltonian. And if I want to measure uh, the probability distribution associated to the transition between the different uh, eigenstates of the initial and the final Hamiltonian, I could do it, perform what people call as a two-point measurement scheme. We can perform a projective measurement here, uh, a non-destructive measurement, then I can perform the evolution, the time-dependent evolution, then another projective measurement. Collecting all the data, I will get uh, the P of W. But it's quite difficult to perform in the lab uh, very uh, high fidelity projective measurement uh, that does not dis destruct the system. And then uh, uh, the error propagation here is also a problem. So these fluctuation theorems that I commented to you uh, uh, before, oh, sorry, it's another way, uh, was not tested up to a few, few years ago in a, in a quantum system. It was tested in a classical system, but to test it in a quantum system uh, uh, is, uh, was difficult because this two-point measurement scheme was quite challenged in order to, to, to get information about this, this, this guy here. If I can measure the probability distribution in a forward protocol and in a backward protocol, I can measure experimentally the free energy. So this is a way to, to determine free energy in an experimental setup. I, actually, this is the only way that I know uh, to, to determine free energy. Now, again, uh, the quantum information plays some role. So uh, instead of measure the probability distribution, we can measure the characteristic function of the probability distribution. The characteristic function is the Fourier transform of the distribution. Then here I have this distribution. When we take the Fourier transform of the distribution, we will get this expression here, and you can write this in terms of this trace. So measuring the characteristic function will be the estimation of this trace, right? And uh, we have in quantum computation an algorithm which is named the trace estimation. But here, this trace is not easy to estimate because we have here the Hamiltonian of the initial state, the, the initial Hamiltonian. Here I have the final Hamiltonian tau is the final time uh, for the evolution, and u is the variable in the, in, the, in the Fourier transform. If I measure the characteristic function, I just need to take the inverse Fourier transform, and then I will get the work probability distribution. So uh, one way to do, in, so instead of measure directly these transition probabilities, uh, the idea is to measure this characteristic function, which is a kind of an oscillating function. Uh, to estimate this trace, we can use this kind of algorithm, quantum algorithm. So here I have a controlled operation, which is not a CNOT gate, which is this uh, uh, controlled of this unitary. Here I have the protocol that I want to describe the energy fluctuations uh, in order to get the work distribution or the heat distribution. And here I have an ancillary system, another qubit. So this is the system that you want to study the non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And here uh, uh, we have, again, another controlled operation with it's associated with this guy. If you compute the output of this circuit here in this ancillary qubit, you will see the following. Uh, the mean value of sigma x and sigma y 
here of this ancillary qubit will be exactly the real and the imaginary part of the characteristic function. If we are talking about spins, we can use this kind of interferometry to encode in the magnetization of this spin system uh, the, work the characteristic function of the work distribution. This is what we want to measure. So uh, for who is familiar with quantum optics, we'll see that this is very similar to a Ramsey interferometric scheme. So performing this, we can start uh, uh, the thermodynamics of the, that small systems. So we will consider the following protocol uh, in a spin system. We will modulate a uh, heat frequency field in order to decrease the gap of the system. So this, is, this will be analogous to compressing or expanding of a piston. So the forward protocol could be a compression and the backward protocol could be an expansion. If I, if I do it very fast, uh, here I have a spin one half system decreasing uh, the energy gap. I can get transitions between the ground state to the ground state of the final state uh, of, of, of the final Hamiltonian, or the ground state to the excited state of the final Hamiltonian, and so on. So, so it's my time. I, can 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 I have five minutes, or just? But I have another lecture. But <laughs> so. Uh, just to finish the things, sorry, I, I, I was I was too too slow today, and and uh, so this is the picture, and the idea is to perform uh, this change of the intensity of the field and also change the direction of the field in in a in, in a way that the Hamiltonian will not commute in different times, and I have a kind of a linear slope, I will increase the gap. Like this, I start with two kilohertz, a frequency of two kilohertz for this gap, and then you end up with 3.6 kilo, kilohertz, and tau is the total time of the evolution. When, when we do it, uh, we can see if this kind of evolution is a unitary evolution or not, performing quantum process tomography. Uh, if, you, if you prepare states that we call as maximally unbiased basis, a state that belongs to that basis, or uh, that can get the maximum information about a process and perform a full state tomography at the end, we can describe the map uh, of the evolution. So we can write a general evolution in quantum mechanics as a map instead of uh, uh, this encompass uh, unitary evolution and also an open system evolution. So, for example, we can choose a basis of the operator. So here, I, uh, I choose these, the, the Pauli operators. This is just a one qubit. And uh, we have this process matrix. Uh, we have the identity plus the Pauli operators. And this is the process matrix here. Uh, with this map here, we can describe any evolution. Uh, we can get information about this map, performing the protocol that I, I said to you, preparing few initial states and performing full quantum state tomography. And this is uh, the, 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 the experimental result for the expansion protocol that I showed to you before and the compression protocol. When we choose this operator basis, uh, a unital protocol, a protocol that preserves identity, also a unitary protocol, uh, should have a real, uh, a real process matrix. And we, we have a real process matrix here. And we can also compare our process with the nearest unitary process. And we can also compare with the theory to see how uh, close and how uh, far away we are from the theory. So here we have what to, we call tracy distance uh, of the process matrix. So this is the trace of the, of the modulus of the process matrix of the experimental result and the ideal result. So we can see how distinguishable is my experiment from the unitary dynamics of the theory. Uh, for a very fast uh, uh, compression and expansion protocol, this is the time for compression and expansion in microseconds, we have uh, uh, the deviation from the ideal unitary protocol of uh, 2.5%, less than 2.5%. So I almost have in the lab a unitary protocol. 
when, when we have a long protocol, when we go to a protocol which is near to the adiabatic, to the quantum adiabatic uh, uh, limit, uh, we have more errors due to the non-homogeneity of the control field. And these are the transition probability between the, the ground state and the excited state. When we perform this faster, we have a, 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 a bigger probability for the transitions. When we perform this slower, we, we have less transition probability. So this is a way to test uh, if our, 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 the protocol that we implement in the lab uh, is, is in fact a unitary protocol. So I will, oh, sorry. I will end this lecture at this point, and then afternoon uh, I will start from this point. But uh, uh, yeah, I I hope to show to show to you more exciting results about quantum thermodynamics. Sorry by the complication of this last part. Thank you. Yes, yes, I will show in the next lecture. <laughs> there is a formal, a formal expression that relates entropy production uh, to information quantities. Actually, the Kubak divergence and things like that. So, thank you. Can you go to? Yeah. So, first we break time. Uh, let's restart at 11 today. Uh,